All right, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody here tonight. Thanks for coming. I know uh, it seems like every year I give this talk, it's snowing outside, so I'm always impressed when people come and kind of brave the roads. We, uh, my name's Bill Fraunheim. I'm one of the cardiologists in town. I've been here about 23 years. I work uh, officially for Spectrum Health, but I've been in Holland the whole time I've been here. So uh, we have a, a Holland group. There are six of us, and uh, this is where we practice, and this is where we like to be. Most of my time, I spend talking about uh, people, I spend talking about heart disease, uh, and I treat people with heart disease all day. Today, I get to talk more about prevention. You know, how, what do we do to keep our hearts healthy? So this is one of my favorite things to talk about because this is what really makes a difference. I mean, if we're talking about where the bang for the buck is, it's all about prevention. So let me um, start by just talking about what the bad guy is, what we're trying to prevent. So this is, this is the bad guy here. This is the accumulation of, of sticky, waxy, yellow, gunky plaque in the blood vessels of the heart and other parts of the body. And this plaque, when it accumulates, can interrupt the blood flow to the, to the heart. Or if it's to the brain, to the brain. Or if it's to the legs, to the legs. And if it gets really bad, this can close the artery off completely. And then there's no blood flow. So if you have no blood flow, say that blockage is right here, there's no blood, then this part of the heart dies, and that's a heart attack. If this happens to the brain, that's a stroke. If this happens to the leg, that's what we call peripheral vascular disease, and those people end up with amputations. So we want to prevent this. It's the number one killer of men and women in the country. More than all forms of cancer combined, at least 25% of deaths from this kind of hardening of the arteries. It's important to note it starts early. It starts in your 20s. When they do autopsies of people killed in the service, they find plaque. And so we want to prevent it at a young age. So how are we doing? How are we doing in this country with, with prevention? Well, not, to, not so good. I only have a couple of graphs. This is one. Just bear with me. So this is the United States. And this is life expectancy. This, our life expectancy is going up to about 79, which is less than the life expectancy of all the countries in Europe, some countries in Asia like Japan, some countries in South America like Chile. And despite that, our spending, which is on this axis, we're spending $9,000 per person in this country. And these other countries who are living longer are spending half as much. So we're spending twice as much. We're not living as long. In fact, for the first time in the last few years, we've actually seen a decline in life expectancy in the country. That's unheard of in the Western world. This, this graph doesn't go to 1960, but in 1960, we had the longest life expectancy in the world in this country. So something is definitely wrong. What's wrong? Well, you pro can probably guess. We spend a lot of money on very expensive treatments of advanced disease. You know, these medication prices are outrageous. Uh, we're treating disease after it's already there, where other countries are focusing more on prevention. We don't do a very good job of prevention in this country. Why? Well, in part, um, we have a lot of competing interests. We've got a meat industry, a dairy industry, a processed food and beverage industry, which is, you know, our in, which is a multi-billion dollar industry, which um, can sometimes work against us. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on what we can do to kind of add years to our life. And I'm going to try and bring in the most recent information, because a lot of this stuff everybody's heard of. But there's a lot of really interesting science and articles coming out all the time. So I'm going to try and talk about what's coming out now. So this article just came out on January 14th. 
and it was published by the, the people over at Harvard. And they identified these five healthy habits. If you have these at age 50, you'll live on the average 10 years longer, and not just longer, but disease-free longer. And none of these habits are going to surprise anybody in the room. Uh, here they are. Never smoking, exercising, eating a healthy diet, normal body weight, and moderate alcohol intake. So this is not rocket science, but how many people, how many Americans actually have all five of these at age 50? 2.7%. So it's amazingly low. Easy to say, hard to do. So let me, let, me, uh, let me go through these healthy habits, okay? And just one through five, we're going to talk about each of them, and then we're going to be done. So healthy habit number one is not smoking. Now, I'm not going to say much about this but because it's so obvious, but just on January 23rd of this year, the Surgeon General published the first report on smoking in 30 years. And it didn't tell us anything we really didn't know. Smoking is the number one cause of preventable death and disability in the, in the United States, harming every organ, almost every organ in the body. Smoking cessation is beneficial at any age. You quit at 60, 70, 80, it, you start to reap benefits. Uh, it can add up to a decade to your life. And... It's, kind of, it's good news in a way. So I, I think this is positive. From 1965 to 2018, smoking rates decreased from 52 to 14% in this country. So we've made a lot of progress with smoking. So it's kind of interesting, actually, that as smoking has decreased, you know, our mortality has leveled off and actually our life expectancy has decreased a little bit as smoking, as people quit smoking. And so some of the reason that we're, we're not adding years of life, uh, uh, we're not increasing life expectancy anymore, that is, is death in more middle age. And they call it deaths of despair. It's deaths from alcoholism, deaths from drug use, and suicides that are actually starting to bring our, our life expectancy down. Anyhow, that's, that's number one, not smoking. Number two is a healthy body weight. Okay, so this is, I think, the only other graph I have. What this shows you, this is weight. Okay, and weight is measured by BMI, body mass index. Ideal is 25. And this is death from heart disease as you go up. So under, under 25, you have a very low risk unless you're really, really, really skinny. And then your risk actually goes up. This is a J-shaped curve. You can be too skinny. At 25 of BMI, which is optimal, you start to go up. Overweight is 25 to 30. Once you go over 30 in the BMI, then the increase is, what they, is exponential. So then the, the mortality rate from just being overweight goes up even more. So everybody, I think everybody knows this. Uh, I don't think this is rocket science, but what people might not realize is over here. Increased BMI is also related to increased risk of cancer. And it's increased risk of cancer in all of these locations. Liver, pancreas, breast, ovary, all the way up and down. And so that to me is not necessarily so intuitive. How is, is body mass related to increased risk of cancer? And I think it goes to a change in the way we think. We used to think that fat cells were just storage cells in the body, that they were just storage vesicles. And now we realize that fat cells are actually very metabolically active. So fat cells release hormones, and they release hormones that affect the immune system. The immune system fights disease. So these, this is a very active interaction of fat cells with the immune system, which protects us from diseases like cancer. All right, now, healthy habit number three, alcohol. So this is kind of a, this is, this is a dicey one because al alcohol is both a poison and a tonic. 
it's mostly a poison. All right, so alcohol, um, heavy drinking is defined as three or more drinks in uh, a day for a man, two or more drinks in a day for a woman. So heavy drinking is a major problem in this country, increased cause of death, half of fatal traffic accidents related to drinking, heavy drinking damages the liver and the heart, contributes to depression, interferes with relationships, probably everybody in this room has had some experience with knowing someone who's, who's had issues with heavy drinking. Even moderate alcohol in women increases the risk of breast and other cancers. So you're never gonna, you're never gonna see a physician recommend alcohol to prevent heart disease. But having said that, there's a lot of science that does suggest limited alcohol can prevent heart disease. So moderate drinking seems to be good for the heart. This is, this is less than three drinks a day for men, less than one drink a day for women. It tends to reduce cardiovascular risk. It raises the good cholesterol. It may protect against diabetes and gallstones. And the type of alcohol doesn't matter. So we, we get this all the time. What is it? Is it red wine? You know, it's this French paradox, but the fact is it, it doesn't seem to, to be red wine over anything else. It's, it's more the ethanol and alcohol that seems to um, be protective in moderation. So like I said, I'm never going to recommend that someone start drinking to protect themselves from heart disease, but I will, you know, suggest if you do, then just keep it in moderation. Keep it in moderation. Okay, so healthy habit number four. This is exercise. So these guidelines came out in November of 2018. These are the newest guidelines uh, for, for Americans. They're recommending um, 150 minutes of exercise per week. This is kind of the same recommendation we've had for, for years, but they did change it a little bit because now they say it doesn't have to be in 10 minute increments or 15 minute increments. Every bit counts. So if you walk from the parking lot into the store, that counts. If you vacuum your floor, that counts. So it's, they, they've kind of made it a little bit easier to hit this 150 minute goal. We're learning more of, more of the benefits of exercise and I think most people are probably familiar with them, but exercise has an immediate effect on anxiety, blood pressure, sleep, blood sugar, and long-term protection against cancer, heart disease, stroke, dementia, blood pressure, diabetes, depression, falls, balance, length of life. So I always tell people, if there's a fountain of youth, it is regular exercise. There is no doubt about it. If we had a pill that, we, that would do this, I, I would be completely out of business. Because people will take a pill, but people won't exercise. So how many people get, get the exercise, meet these guidelines? About 20%, one in five. So this I think we've known, but I, there's some really interesting, really interesting articles on how this happens. So what is exercise really doing? So I, this, this article just came out in August of 2019. And what it showed is that regular exercise, the muscles of regular exercisers are indistinguishable from muscles of people 25 years younger. And they looked at the form, they looked at the, the size of the muscle, and they looked at the function, so mass and function. So they took, look at this, so they took a young person's muscle, and they, there's three things it takes to make a muscle work. It's the input, that's, that's a neuron. So think of that as like the accelerator on a car. And then it's the fuel, this comes from these, they're called mitochondria. It's like the, the octane of the gas. So 93 octane versus 88. And then it's the protein, which is the muscle, the size of the engine. So you need these three things to make a muscle work. And people who do not exercise, as symbolized here, they lose the, the, the input, they lose the quality of the fuel, the, the fuel, the mitochondria decrease, and the muscle actually shrinks. And then, of course, they're, 
at an older age ending up with a walker or worse. Now, if you're a regular exerciser, your muscle mass is preserved, the innervation does not shrink, the mitochondria and the, and the protein composition stay very similar. So to me, it's really interesting to look and see, okay, we got these big benefits, but now we're starting to understand what happens at a microscopic level. I mean, we're really, and it's, it's all amazing. So here's another one, and this is exercise in the brain. This, um, there's tons of articles that have come out in the past year or two on how exercise affects the brain. And the bottom line is the brain acts like a muscle, just like every other muscle in the body. The brain, they're saying now, it can grow, it can shrink, it changes size based on your lifestyle. So, and that happens through a similar mechanism that I just showed you with other muscles. So exercise increases chemicals in the brain. It increases the number of neurons. That's the input. It improves the function of connections, it speeds up the, the transmission in the brain, and it actually enlarges a part of the brain called the hippocampus. So if you're exercising, your brain will look different. And this is, this is the result of that. So decreased stress, uh, fights depression, lowers the risk of dementia, improves mood, you actually have more brain cells as your brain gets bigger, and you're, you are smarter. So when I drove my daughter to college in September for the first time in freshman year, she was stuck in the car with me for six and a half hours, and I spent at least an hour telling her how important it was for her to exercise because it would make her smarter. And it, it's absolutely true. And uh, actually, I think she believed me because she has, she's actually exercising and doing a pretty good job. Um, so some people, you know, now there's issues with exercise, obviously. Some people just, it's, it's just too hard. I mean, 10,000 steps, 10,000 steps is a lot of steps. Well, it turns out 10,000 steps is hogwash. 10,000 steps came from a Japanese marketing campaign when they produced the very first pedometer in 1964 before the Tokyo Olympics. And they just called their, their pedometer a manpo, manpo meter or manpo kai, which means 10,000 steps. This is one of those like original advertisements. There's no science there. So in this article, that came out in June of 2019, they said, how many steps does it really take? And they said, and they looked at older women, they said 4,500 steps a day is what it takes to get a significant benefit from walking, 4,500. And it kind of peaked at 7,500. There's, there's, no, there's no great benefit in this study after 7,500. So for those people who just can't get 10,000 steps, don't worry about it. A 30 minute walk is equal to about 3,000, 4,000 steps. So what about, I mean, walking, it takes time. And you know, for some people come in and they say, it's just, it's too boring. You know, I don't wanna, it's too boring, it takes too long. Well, there's a ton of science now about these high intensity interval training programs called HIT. These HIT programs, they, they combine short bursts of really intense exercise. Have you, anybody in here tried to try this? It, well, it's a lot of work, trust me. My wife does it, and she's had me doing it for about two weeks, it's killing me. I mean, but the fact is, it's not for everybody, but, but there's a ton of benefit from shortened bursts of exercise. And this, this is the most popular exercise trend they're saying in, in the year 2020. There's a brand new hit gym that opened right across the street from the hospital called Top Tech or something like that. This is a seven minute workout that was published in the New York Times. Seven minutes. So each of these 12 things you do for 30 seconds and then you take a five second break and you're done in seven minutes. So it's kind of, uh, I mean, it, it's popular. A lot of people are doing it and there, there's a lot of benefit there. So there's a lot of benefit to HIIT training. Um, some people say, well, 
I'm too old. I mean, I can't, I can't do that. Um, and, you know, for hit, I mean, maybe that's true. But this article that just came out in September looked at runners who started, started running after the age of 50, and people who started running in their 50s became as swift and well-muscled as older runners who trained lifelong. So it's just not, it's, you can catch up. It's not too late. So I tried to convince my dad of this. So my dad, he was, he was like 80, but I started trying to, when he died, I tried starting to convince him when he was like 70. He's like, I'm too old. I'm too old. This is 50-year-olds. I can't do it. Well, okay, fine. How about a 105-year-old? <laughs> he, um, this article came out in the New York Times a couple years ago. This guy right here set a world record when he was 100 years old for distance biked in an hour. He went 14 miles. And then he started training. When he was, two years later, when he was 102, he improved his aerobic capacity by 13% and his power 40% comparable to a 50 year old. And he broke his own world record and went 17 miles in 60 minutes. So it really is never too late. I tell people the older you are, the more benefit you get from exercise. Because an 18-year-old can get away with anything. And they can sit on the couch all day, get up and run a mile. The older you get, the less you can get away with. And so the greater the benefit. All right, the last thing is diet. This is this, we have screwed up diet in this country so bad because it's just too many competing interests. This article came out um, just in October. And I, I don't know if you heard about, about it. This article in the Annals of Internal Medicine, which is one of our best journals, this is like a really prestigious journal, came out and said, you know what? Unprocessed red meat and processed meat is not bad for you. You can eat what you can continue to eat it, no problem. Did anybody hear about this? Because this made like major headlines. Yeah. And so everybody was like, what? This makes no sense. This goes against everything we believe. Well, sure enough, a couple months later, author of study saying red meat is fine, failed to disclose that he was on the payroll of the meat industry. They had to retract the whole article. So if they can fool the annals of internal medicine, who has a whole scientific panel reviewing the, the information, you know, how are we supposed to know who to believe? Well. These are my, these are my um, recommendations. I would, not, I would not go to the US dietary guidelines. They came out in 2015, they're old. There was a lot of, of industry involvement in there. I would go to the Canadian food guidelines which came out in January 2019. These were the first guidelines that did not have people from industry. So the red meat, the dairy, the processed food and beverage industry had no representatives on this panel. So they underscored the, the problem with diet, which they said 50% of all deaths from heart disease were attributed to diet in 2017. So diet's a major problem. This is their plate, okay? This is the foods you should eat and the proportions you should eat. You probably can't see that, but you can go to Canada.ca food guide and look it up. And it's probably on a handout if you have it. So they, they emphasized vegetables, fruits, whole grains, just, just plant-based foods. Among proteins, they said eat plants. They did not say you cannot eat meat. But what they did is they took the meat and they put it in that little corner. <laughs> so it's that, that's how much meat. And they took the dairy and they got rid of it. So it's milk. I mean, I'm sorry, it's water. Again, they didn't say you can't do it, but it's not part of the daily plate, all right? Because dairy is full of fat. So they want you to replace the saturated fat with unsaturated fat. The saturated fat comes from animals. So we're trying to decrease saturated fat. That's animal products. That's um, meat and dairy. The unsaturated fat is from plants, nuts, seeds, and, and fish, vegetable oils, avocados. Water is the beverage of choice. 
So this would be one great source to look for if you're looking at dietary recommendations. Here's another one. This is Harvard, Harvard School of Public Health. This is their plate. This is a fantastic website. It's called nutritionsource.org. Um, that's where I go to, nutritionsource.org. They'll show you the plate. They'll talk about all the foods, why you should eat them, why you shouldn't eat them, recipes, and everything else. And this plate looks a lot like the other plate. Okay, so it's just another, another reference. Where's, where's your diet? Everybody in the room probably has a slightly different diet. Where's your diet on the list? So U.S. News and World Report, the 2020 diets came out, just came out. Number one for about the 10th, well, I don't know, fifth year in a row is the Mediterranean diet. There was 35 diets on this list. And in these diets, they're all just like the diets I just showed you. They're all plant-based, low dairy, low meat diets. So these are the good ones. Well, what about the bad ones? These are the worst ones. Okay, so of 35 diets, keto was number 34. Anybody here on the keto diet? Somebody's got to be on the keto diet. It's, it's supposed to be the number most popular diet in America right now. Um, and Atkins diet, so. Let me just mention, I want to talk about the keto diet just for a couple minutes because I think, it's, I think, number one, it is one of the most popular diets in America. So what the keto diet does, it's super high fat. All right, greater than 70% of your calories are from fat, really low in carbs. The goal is to alter the body's fuel and burn fat instead of sugar, which is not a bad idea because, you know, fat, as we said, I mean, excess fat cells increase the risk of cancer. This diet is aimed to, to burn fat. So this is how it does it. So our traditional diet, we eat carbs. The pancreas makes insulin. Insulin takes the carbs and moves the carbs into the cells and we make energy. So this is a carbohydrate-based diet, traditional diet. The keto diet, you eat fat. A different chemical breaks down fat. It's called lipase. And then this, light, this fat, fatty acids go to the liver and the liver makes ketones. So it's a different type of metabolism. And this different type of metabolism has been proven to be very good for short-term weight loss. It's more palatable for some people because it's, you know, I mean, you're eating bacon double cheeseburgers on this diet without the bun. Um, I'm not making that recommendation, but that, that's, that's the keto diet. Um, it has been shown to have beneficial short-term metabolic changes because the carbs are so low, it, your blood sugar goes down, triglycerides go down, insulin resistance improves. Um, the high fat might decrease food cravings, so you might be less hungry on the keto diet. And for years, for years it's been used to treat seizures in children. This diet is actually, the first articles on this diet came out in the 1920s. So those are the good things. What about the cons? Well, there's some side effects that you can get from it because the fiber's so low, you can get constipation. Um, there's possible nutritional deficiencies because they exclude, they don't want you eating entire food groups. For example, whole grains, legumes, some kinds of fruit. Well, whole grains, legumes, and fruit are some of the most nutritionally dense products on the planet that they are excluding from the diet. It has variable amounts, that the fat can come, can be healthy fat or unhealthy fat. You can get lots of fat from fish or lots of fat from pork bellies, you know, and they don't really distinguish. Um, and there's just no long-term data. So the, the keto diet in the scientific community is, you know, it's got pros, it's got cons, it's, it's you know, long-term it's not, depending on the form, it's not, I don't think, going to be a, a long-term healthy option. But for people that want to lose weight and then transition to a more sustainable, healthy diet, I, I think it's okay. But what if you could take all these pros and get rid of all the cons? Then, you know what you'd have? You'd have intermittent fasting. 
intermittent fasting, this is where it's at. I am not, this, I'm convinced. This article just came out December 26th in the New England Journal of Medicine. The New England Journal of Medicine is the most prestigious journal in the world. So these are the scientists, this is the leading thought leaders in the world, and they're coming out saying, evidence is accumulating that if we compress our eating into a short period, six hours, and then fast, we trigger the same metabolic switch. Okay, you switch from sugar to fatty acids with all the same benefits. So now you're eating a healthy diet and you're getting the same benefit of the ketone kind of metabolism. So, a couple slides on this and then we're done. This is only, so this is a, a picture from the New England Journal. The only reason I put it up here is to show you that they looked at the mechanism, you know, they've studied the mechanism of this diet on cells and they think its beneficial effects extend to the liver, muscle, heart, brain, these are the fatty acids that are destroyed, and it results in significant benefits. And here's the benefits that have been suggested in different studies. Stimulates the brain, increases fat meta metabolism for sure, because that's what it does, burns fat, help prevents cancer. We already know that fat cells kind of correlate with cancer, so if you decrease, that makes sense. Promotes weight loss, it is a good diet for weight loss improves glucose tolerance, lowers your blood sugar, that's for sure, boosts the immune system because fat cells harm the immune system and helps heart function. So we, they're telling us now in this article that we have to be teaching med students about the keto diet. I'm just, this is what they're saying. We have to go to, to medical education and we have to teach the science and the risks and, and, and how to implement this diet in our medical education. We have to do this to physicians, dietitians, and nurses. All these specialists should be familiar with the benefits of intermittent fasting. Uh, forget about that. Here, here's two ways to do it. So you might say, well, what's, what is intermittent fasting? Well, the two most common ways to do it are to restrict your feeding, and that means you eat over a shorter and shorter time during each day. So it takes four months for the body to get used to where you want to go to. So they're saying in month one, you eat over a 10 hour period. And that's just five days a week. Month two, you eat over an eight hour period. And then month three is six hour, five days a week. And month four is the goal, eating over six hours, seven days a week. This. So I'm trying to do this too, because I'm like most Americans. Most Americans eat five times a day. They're not whole meals anymore, because we're eating snacks. But they've done studies that we eat five times a day. I eat four meals a day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then I get bored at like 9 p.m. and I eat. Uh, this, this, is not, this is not, you know, the way that our bodies are designed. Okay, constant grazing just feeds the body with sugar. And this is trying to get away from that. Another way to do it is to do what they call 5-2. That means two days a week, you eat less. So the first month, you eat 1,000 calories one day a week. And then second month, 1,000 calories two days a week, and down and down until you're down to 500 calories two days a week. I mean, neither of these are, are easy, but they say, that once you, your body gets used to it, it becomes, it becomes doable. So that's, that's diet. Now, here's a way to put, to, to kind of, this is a win-win. So you're eating the right diet and you're exercising. This article, which came out October of 2019, said, if you exercise before you eat, you're going to burn twice as much fat with the same amount of exercise. So, you know, I always used to just like eat a snack or something and then go exercise. No. So what we want to do is we want to exercise and then eat. Because if, you're, if you don't have sugar in your body when you're exercising, you're going to burn fat. 
and all this keto diet, all this intermittent fasting, and all this exercise on an empty stomach is designed to burn fat. Now, these people obviously aren't, you got to do more than sit next to the bike, but uh, <laughs> they're probably having more fun. <laughs> all right, so in conclusion, um, we've talked about five, five basic components to a healthy lifestyle. Those five things, if you can do them, will add years to your life and disease-free years. Nutrition and exercise science remains extremely active. We're learning about new mechanisms and benefits all the time. And it's never too late to start. Even 100-year-olds benefit from exercise programs. 